Story recapped here. Today, I'm going to explain a horror sci-fi film called Body Snatchers. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. Marty Malone has been looking forward to her summer vacation, but she has no choice but to spend most of it on the road because her father, Steve, has been assigned by the Environmental Protection Agency to investigate possible contamination in a military base in Alabama. Joining them on the trip is her stepmother, Carol, and her six-year-old half-brother Andy. Carol and Andy are enjoying the road trip, but Marty feels left out as nobody asked her what she wanted to do for her vacation. During a stop at a gas station, Marty is suddenly attacked by a soldier inside the bathroom. The man holds a knife against her throat and covers her mouth to prevent her from screaming. When he notices that she's afraid, he slowly removes his hand from her mouth and warns her that they are out there, and they get people when they're asleep. When he releases Marty, she runs to her dad and tells him that someone with a knife attacked her in the toilet. But when Steve enters the bathroom, there's nobody there. When they arrive at the base, they are assigned to a house in Sector C. As Marty looks around the house, she finds out that there are only two bedrooms. Carol tells her that she'll have to share a room with Andy. Instead of helping her father unpack, Marty wanders around the base and comes across a restricted area. Several military personnel approach her, telling her that she can't stay there without a security clearance. Before long, a girl in a red convertible arrives and tells Marty to get inside the car. The girl introduces herself as Jen and tells her that her father runs the base. Jen takes Marty to her home and tries to introduce Marty to her mother, but she's passed out on a sofa. Jen discloses that her mother is an alcoholic as she takes a sip of her mother's vodka. That night, Andy wakes up from a nightmare, so she goes to his parents' bedroom. As Carol tries to put the boy at ease, they hear a man screaming outside while some military personnel loads him in a truck. The next day, Steve meets up with General Platt, so he could start his investigation. Platt, who's not enthusiastic about Steve's presence at the base, tells a captain to assist Steve in any way so he could leave as soon as possible. While gathering samples at the river, Major Collins, head of the base medical corps, approaches Steve and asks him about the possible effects of exposure to chemicals. Steve informs him that most of the chemicals stored at the base are toxic. Collins asks him if there are psychological effects from chemical exposure because he has witnessed a few soldiers exhibiting psychosis and paranoia. Some of them are afraid to sleep, while others are afraid of their own family. Steve tells him that he has no idea what Collins has seen, but he assures him that it's not related to the chemicals. Before leaving Steve to his work, Collins asks him to keep him up to date about his investigation. Back at the house, several soldiers arrive to deliver some equipment for Steve. Marty lets them in, but she's puzzled when she finds the soldiers inside her father's room. When she asks them what they're doing, they claim that they're just delivering the boxes. Meanwhile, Andy is brought to a daycare center, where children are taught to draw. When the teacher tells the kids to hold their pictures up, they all have drawn the same artwork except Andy. When Andy sees the other drawings, he gets confused and starts to wonder if he's done something wrong. Later on, he leaves the daycare center and runs around the military base on his own. When a serviceman named Tim asks what he's doing around the base, Andy tells him that he's running away from bad people. When Tim takes the boy home, Marty points out that he's still supposed to be in daycare. Andy tells her that he hates the place because they all had the same pictures and tried to make him go to sleep. When Steve arrives, Marty starts flirting with Tim and learns that he's a chopper pilot. Before heading back to the barracks, Tim lets her know that he usually hangs out at a bar called Top Gun. Later that night, Carol is perplexed that Andy is already having trouble fitting in at the daycare when he's only been there for a day. Steve tells Carol that they should take him back there soon so he could make new friends. While Marty washes the dishes, Jen knocks on the door and tells Marty to come with her. Before they could leave, Carol sees Jen and invites her in. When Jen introduces herself to Steve, he learns that she's the general's daughter. Jen tells Steve that she stopped by so she could take Marty out and show her around. Steve agrees to let Marty go, but he tells her to be home by midnight. Jen takes Marty to a bar, where they come across Tim and a serviceman named Pete. Jen notices that the place looks empty, so she asks Pete where the others are. Pete quips that they avoided the place because they heard Jen's dad is coming. When Jen leaves with Pete, Tim offers Marty a beer. As they get acquainted, two military personnel enter the room and grab a soldier sleeping at the other end of the bar. As one of the officers turns to them, Marty is struck with fear when she recognizes him as the man who attacked her at the gas station. When they confront him about the incident, the officer tells them that he doesn't know what they're talking about. The officer advises Tim to take Marty home, asserting that she might have too much to drink. When the officer leaves, Tim tries to follow him, but Marty stops him, saying she might have made a mistake. Somewhere near the camp, soldiers are picking up huge pods from a swamp to load them into a truck. Meanwhile, Andy gets up from his bed and looks for Carol in their room, but when he gets closer, her body decomposes. As he screams in horror, he sees Carol entering the room, but Andy senses that she's not his mother. He runs to his dad, telling him that his mother died. Carol follows him downstairs and tells Steve that Andy had a bad dream. When Carol tries to put him to bed, Andy runs out of the house, insisting that she's not his mother. As Steve runs after the boy, Marty arrives with Tim and her friends. Steve tells Marty to take Andy back inside the house and confronts Tim. He informs Tim that Marty shouldn't be drinking because she's underage. Tim apologizes, but Steve tells him not to show up at the house anymore. 
As Marty tries to put Andy to sleep, he tells her that the woman that looks like Carol is not his mother. Marty thinks that the boy had a nightmare, so she tells him that she had terrible dreams too when she was his age. Steve confronts Marty for getting home late and intoxicated, but Marty argues that she only had one beer. When Steve refuses to believe her, Marty tells him that she shouldn't bother talking with him because he never listens to her. In the morning, Marty tells Steve that she can't wait till she turns 18 so she could leave the house. Steve tells her that if she wants to leave, she doesn't have to wait till she's 18. When Marty goes out, Steve asks Andy whether he wants to go to daycare or stay with his mother. Andy, however, reiterates that his mother is dead. When Steve looks at Carol to see how she'd react, she just stares at him and forces a smile. Inside a warehouse at the base, Steve is testing some toxic chemicals when somebody accidentally drops two barrels from the forklift. One of the crew members gets burned, so Steve tells them to call an ambulance. However, another crew member tells Steve not to worry, saying they can take care of the injured man. Steve is horrified to see the injury, but the crew seems oddly calm. When Marty visits Jen at home, Jen tells hints that something might be wrong with her mother. She points out that her mother's glass is usually filled with vodka, but at the time, there's nothing but water. Jen's mother leaves the house, telling them that she will play bridge at their neighbor's house, but Jen stresses that her mother doesn't know how to play bridge. Meanwhile, Steve goes back to the warehouse to take a tissue sample from the suit burned in the accident. When he tests the sample, he can't identify the substance because it doesn't show up on the list of herbicides. He calls his office and tells them that he will send the sample the next day. That evening, Andy tells Marty that he wants to go home. Marty assures him that their father will take them home as soon as he finishes the investigation. When Marty tells him that everything will be fine, Andy suddenly blurts out that it happens when they sleep. When Marty asks what he means, Andy tells her, you die. Carol then enters their room to tell Marty that the bathtub is ready. When Marty goes to the bathroom, Carol urges Andy to get in bed. The child hesitates, fearing that he'll die when he sleeps, but he eventually agrees. As Marty falls asleep in the bathtub, tentacles start creeping out of a pot hidden in the ceiling. Carol notices that Steve's arching his back in the bedroom, so she offers him a massage. Soon, the tentacles reach Marty and creep into her nose. In the bedroom, tentacles have also started entering Steve's body as Carol watches. As the pod above the ceiling turns into a human, Marty suddenly wakes up and swiftly removes the tentacles from her face. As she gasps for air, the body falls on top of her. Horrified from seeing a copy of herself, she gets up from the bathtub and runs to her father's bedroom. When she finds him in bed, she removes the tentacles and wakes him up. A hand suddenly grabs her ankle from beneath the bed, so she pulls away, dragging Steve's duplicate out in the open. Not long, the body starts to wither and gets pulled back under the bed. Meanwhile, Carol calmly calls someone on the phone, asking duplicates to go to their house. When Steve finds Carol, he tells her that they need to leave. Carol, however, stresses that there's nowhere to go because what they just experienced is happening everywhere. She warns them that they can't run or hide because there's no one like them left. Steve finally realizes that Carol is not the same person he once knew. Carol tells him not to be afraid because all the fear and confusion will soon disappear when he sleeps. As she walks towards Steve, she convinces him to join them, saying they will be connected and he'll feel fantastic when he wakes up. When Marty and Andy reach the front door, Steve shoves Carol away and runs out of the house. Carol walks outside the door and emits an ear-piercing wail, calling other duplicates. People rush outside of their homes to run after Steve and Marty. When they get to a corner of the sector, three men start shooting at the people chasing them. Tim is startled by the gunshots and the wailing outside, so he asks Petey if he knows what's happening. As he searches around the house, he comes across Petey and other MPs in the bathroom. Petey tells him to go to sleep. When he refuses, they try to subdue him, but he fights back and manages to escape. Meanwhile, Steve takes Marty and Andy to a warehouse and tells them to wait for him while he calls for help. As the duplicates continue to search for them, Steve sneaks into a building and finds himself in an office. He tries using the phone, but he hears someone else using it. When he enters another room, he finds Major Collins trying to connect to an outside line. However, the woman on the other end tells Collins that all the lines are busy at the moment. Collins gets hysterical when the woman calls him by his name even though he never mentioned it. He throws the phone against the wall and takes some amphetamines. When Steve approaches him, the Major points a gun at Steve, telling him to stay back. Steve asks him if he has a car, but the Major argues that it's too late to run. Collins tells him that they have to stand up and fight because the duplicates will just come after them if they run. Collins offers him some amphetamines, advising him not to fall asleep. When Steve hears people arriving, he hides in the next room. General Platt soon enters the room with a few MPS to convince Collins to allow them to replace him with a duplicate. The General reveals that there are already thousands of them on Earth, and they have grown stronger as they travel across the universe. The duplicates contend that the individual is not essential because only unity can guarantee survival. They further stress that the human race is doomed on its own, so he should join them if he wants to survive. As the general and the other duplicates approach him, Colin shoots himself in the head rather than let them make a copy of his body. Steve gets back to the warehouse and tells them that he found a way to get out of the base. While driving a jeep out of the camp, Marty notes that the duplicates are already everywhere. When Marty asks where they're going, Steve tells her not to worry because he knows what he's doing. Steve advises her not to show any emotions. 
Marty watches Steve intently as he drives, suspecting that he has already been replaced. When Steve reiterates that he knows what he's doing, Marty pulls the handbrake and tries to take Andy out of the Jeep so they could run. Steve, however, manages to grab her. As she struggles, Tim arrives and tells Steve to let Marty go. Marty runs toward Tim and asks him to shoot Steve, saying he's not her father. Steve calmly tells Tim to put the gun away, but Marty points it at him while Tim is still holding it. Tim tries to take control of the weapon, but Marty eventually manages to pull the trigger, hitting Steve in the chest. After Steve dies, they watch Steve's body disintegrate rapidly, convincing Tim that he's a duplicate. While they drive away, an MP wails to alert the duplicates to their whereabouts. Tim drives to the hangar with the entire army after them and tells Marty to stay at the jeep while he takes out a helicopter. He tells Marty to get ready to move when he lands, Marty advises Tim to act like one of the duplicates to avoid suspicion. When Tim reaches the chopper, Petey and his friends arrive. Tim manages to avoid showing any emotion as Petey observes his reactions to his questioning. As Petey continues to probe him, Tim tells them that they're wasting time because someone is waiting for light support. Before he gets inside the helicopter, Petey tells Tim that he slept with his girlfriend. When Tim doesn't react, Petey tells the MPs to let him fly the chopper. Outside the hangar, the duplicates find Marty and Andy. Tim sees them being forced into a truck, so he follows them. Soon, the truck arrives in the infirmary, so Tim lands the helicopter and looks for them inside. Tim carefully walks around without an expression on his face as he witnesses people being replaced in the room. After looking around the room, Tim finally finds Marty as she is being replaced. While other duplicates are distracted, Tim tries to wake Marty up. Marty's copy soon comes to life, so Tim slowly removes the tentacles from her face. When the duplicate begs him to stop, he swiftly pulls out the tentacles, causing the duplicate to wince in pain. When Marty wakes up, the duplicate starts to wither away. Outside, General Platt's duplicate is assigning trucks to drive to different bases across the US. Meanwhile, Tim and Marty calmly walk out of the infirmary, trying to blend in with the duplicates. Marty asks him if he's seen Andy, but he tells her that he wasn't in the infirmary. As they walk towards the helicopter, Marty tells him that she's not leaving without Andy. Tim tells her that they'll come back for the boy, but she insists on finding him before leaving. As they walk around, they come across Jen, so they try to maintain their cover. When she asks them where they're going, Tim tells her they have work to do. As they leave, Jen whispers to Marty, saying she saw Andy and he's looking for her. Marty keeps walking, but she soon turns around to ask Jen where he saw the boy. Jen starts wailing, so they run towards the chopper. As Tim prepares to fly the helicopter, Andy arrives and calls out to Marty. She takes him inside the chopper and hugs him, but as they fly away, Andy shoves Marty and attacks Tim. Marty tries to pull Andy away as he covers Tim's eyes. Tim tells Marty to throw him out because he's no longer her brother. After she pulls him away from Tim, the boy starts strangling her. When Marty throws the boy off the chopper, he wails as he falls to the ground. Back at the base, the captain asks the general if they should go after the helicopter. General Platt tells him to let them go because no one would believe them. The next day, Tim blows up the military trucks that came out of the Alabama base. Marty confesses that she felt conflicting emotions such as vengeance, despair, hatred, remorse, and pity at the same time as she watches the bombs explode. When they arrive in Atlanta, they are given clearance to land at an airbase. As Tim lands the chopper, Marty recalls her stepmother's words telling them there's nowhere for them to run because there's no one like them left. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.